So I've recently came across this really interesting article that was published by the ex-governor of the People's Bank of China, which is Yi Gang. He was essentially pointing out the nine weakness in the Chinese economy today. And from an outsider perspective, I believe that this is fairly interesting because we probably tend to think that, hey, uh, many of these media outlets are probably part of the party's mechanism, especially if it's a one-party rule in China, um, to essentially help spread propaganda. No, I mean to help spread positive developments of the country. But clearly, we have somebody of authority, of quite high authority if I can argue, um, stating or essentially calling out um, to the senior party leadership about what they can do more. So of course, like Li Qian puts it, when one's not in power, um, one can be more honest. So let's take a deeper look into what he is essentially talking about. And of course, if we were to compare and contrast it with those in power, um, there are four main departments, um, namely the NDRC, the Ministry of Finance, the PBOC, and the MITT, um, talking about the China's economy, all stressing that it's getting better. So in Chinese, it's called Kan Kong Chang Suai Zhong Kuo, belittling China, um, the four major ministries, has produced um, the six key principles or the six key data points that you should look at, um, essentially outlining a better Chinese economy. So let's dive right into what Yi Kang has said. So he said that my country's economy is currently still in the recovery stage after the impact of the pandemic, and we must have confidence and patience. As the balance sheet of economic entities continue to repair, residents will gradually increase consumer spending, thereby creating income and more consumption. Internationally, it will take about a year for consumption to basically recover from the pandemic, but it has only been half a year in my country, and recovery still needs a process. Um, I believe that half a year was really talking about right after the party congress um, back in October or November last year, and we are right around um, two quarters, maybe three quarters into 2023. And like Yi Kang has emphasized, um, you must have confidence and also patience to tide through um, whatever China is going through today. So Yi Kang believes that the current economic operation has several main characteristics. First, the residence department spends less money and repays loans early. So the two-year average growth rate of total retail sales of consumer goods in April and May was 2.6 and 2.5%, which was far lower than the pre-pandemic level of around 8%. So there are certain expectations of salary cuts and austerity psychology among residents, and they tend to increase savings and reduce liabilities. So in the first five months, new time deposits accounted for 90% of new M2, so the phenomenon of prepayment of loans is increasing and the behavior of some micro entities may be inclined to minimize liabilities. And this really signifies the household side of things. I believe that especially in times of crisis or if people are slightly more pessimistic, um, the way out is to be a lot more prudent so that you can tide through any sort of crisis that's going to be thrown your way. Second, the division of enterprise departments is relatively serious. I think there's some issues with the translation, but let's read on. Since the beginning of this year, new credit has mainly flowed to the state-owned sector and scientific technological innovation field. The new energy field has grown rapidly, but is limited in volume probably because it's pretty nascent in terms of the development stage. So compared with the past, real estate has not played a sufficient role in driving the economy. In the first five months, private investment fell by 0.1% year on year. The confidence of private and small and medium-sized enterprises, which contributed significantly to GDP and employment, needs to be boosted. Okay, I think I kind of understand where they're coming from. Um, they're essentially emphasizing that um, state-owned enterprises at the current juncture plays a much more important role in trying to bolster um, the economic development and probably GDP numbers. Um, a lot of all the private and SMEs have had the sledgehammer coming down on them, particularly so for many of these high-tech enterprises. This probably had some sort of a signaling effect, maybe even second or third order impacts to many of these um, private enterprises, which made many of them a little bit more cautious in terms of how they allocate their capital. Which is why we probably don't see this sort of vibrancy that we expected from the Chinese economy. Third, the local debt risk of government departments have increased. So affected by the impact of the epidemic and real estate adjustments, the contradiction between local fiscal revenue and expenditure has become acute. So urban investment debt has reached its debt repayment peak. The chain of land finance followed by infrastructure investment is clearly unsustainable. So project returns are low and debt repayment capacity is also fragile. And this provides little space for local government to exert their efforts. 
Fourth, risks in the real estate market have not yet been cleared. After the little Indian spring in the first quarter, the real estate industry has resumed its downward trend. Investment in real estate development in the first five months fell by 7.2% year-on-year, and the sales area of newly built commercial housing fell by 0.9% year-on-year. So the financing capabilities of real estate companies are still weak, and liquidity tensions have intensified. And clearly, um, I think over the last one year or so, you have seen many um, opinion pieces, um, YouTube videos about how the Chinese economy is going to crash, how Evergrande is going to bring the entire um, Chinese uh, real estate sector down together with them. But one year has passed, I think two years, two and a half years have passed, but there is still very little visibility, at least from an outsider perspective. You see sometimes um, some developers are defaulting on their bonds, and then 30 days later, um, grace period was extended, and then they repaid their bonds, and then the second developer um, facing the same issue again. There really isn't a very hard-handed approach where the government steps in and say that, hey, um, this is our plan, um, we are going to execute on this plan. So because of this very iffy structure, um, very little accountability in this entire real estate sector, um, that's why there is no visibility, investors are probably still feeling jittery, and which is why, um, by translation, there really isn't much confidence being injected back into the Chinese economy. And investors on the sidelines, they're not only skeptical, um, they just don't know what to do with the prevailing information that they have. Fifth, foreign sectors have entered an unstable state, which may overlap with insufficient domestic demand. So US interest rates may stay at a high level for a long time. Its own economic and financial risks are rising, and the global economy is also slowing down. So weak external demand has brought great challenges to my country's stabilization of foreign trade and external demand. So I think in general, um, it does seem like only the US economy is able to achieve that sort of soft landing. China has a whole host of their own internal problems. On, on top of that, if you layer in Europe, I think Europe is also experiencing um, some sort of economic turmoil. The rest of the globe, especially on the eastern side of things, um, a lot of us probably rely on um, China being a strong um, economic partner. So if they slow down, um, we are going to be affected inevitably as well. On top of that, if you have to layer on many of these trade wars, um, banning of chips, banning of exports, imports, um, it's just going to add more tension on our already fragile global economy. Six, there is no basis for deflation in price trends, but we must also pay attention to the balance between supply and demand. So deflation is often accompanied by a contraction in demand, but my country's demand is still recovering and money and credit are growing rapidly, which is not in line with the typical characteristics of deflation. So in June, CPI was flat year on year and PPI fell by 5.4% year on year. As the base decreases and the endogenous power of the economy increases, the CPI center is expected to rise moderately. Um, there were many people asking for my comments about um, China entering into some sort of a deflation and a lost decade of 10 years, um, very much so being the Japan of the century. Um, personally, I don't believe so. I believe that um, at least for now, um, the Chinese household is still flush with cash. And I think in terms of the numbers that were reported by many of these major Chinese banks, I think household savings is at an all-time high. To solve this problem, I really believe that it's just a matter of perception and sentiments. Clearly, the Chinese people are not spending as much as they used to. Um, the Chinese government has to solve the root cause of the problem. Whether is it in terms of instilling confidence or there are other potential issues down the line. Number seven, employment is generally stable, but structural contradictions are prominent. Artificial intelligence gradually replaces mental labor positions. The structural mismatch between labor supply and demand may exist for a long time in the future. Um, I think th there's no easy solution to this, but I get where it's coming from. I think the restructuring and redevelopment of its workforce starts today. If not, it'll probably be too late. Eighth, the monetary policy will increase counter-cyclical adjustments to help stabilize the economic market. Not really sure what it means. In the first half of this year, financial institutions added 15.7 trillion yuan in renminbi loans, an increase of 2 trillion year on year. So financing costs were stable but declining. So the average interest rate on corporate loans in the first five months was 3.96%, a year on year decrease of 0.39 percentage points. In June, the monetary policy operation rate was further guided to drop by 10 basis points, driving the loan market interest rate to fall simultaneously. Um, essentially, um, they are now trying to adopt many of this so-called monetary policy to kind of um, instill and rejuvenate the economy. Um, I think to a very small extent, there is still a very large part, which is the consumption base, that is not unlocked. And like the entire headline of this article suggests, um, he is hoping or he is 
um, advising the government to release um, Chinese consumption potential, which is basically like a hidden dragon, at least from my perspective as well. Number nine, the renminbi exchange rate has weakened due to factors um, such as the high US dollar and intensive domestic foreign exchange purchases during the summer, but it has rebounded recently. So I think in total, um, Yi Gang definitely do have some sort of an insider information because he was the governor of the PBOC for the last five years. I believe it was from 2018 to 2023. He recently just stepped down. Um, it might be a rehash in terms of what you understand of the Chinese economy today, but these are clearly some of the key issues that us as Chinese equities investors pay close attention to. Um, do feel free to leave in the comment section down below on what you are particularly interested or what you are particularly worried about. Um, for me, I do believe that this idea of a consumption potential, I think the current Chinese consumer base, this is something that the stock market probably has not priced in. I don't know when it will be released or will it ever be released, but this is from me. With that, I'll see you in the next video, but more importantly, I'll finally see you on the moon. Goodbye.